um, our next speaker, and that's Gina Absalom. And Gina is a, a, a public health dietitian working in remote Aboriginal communities in Central Australia. Her research is aimed at informing development of sustainable public health programs within remote communities to improve health outcomes, uh, particularly for women. Uh, today, she's presenting on the barriers and enablers of chronic disease management for Aboriginal women in remote Australia. Over to you, Gina. Thank you um, for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen, um, hopefully. All right. Um, so yeah, as John mentioned, my name is Gina Absalom and I'm a public health dietitian in Central Australia. Um, and I'm presenting on the Sugar Sisters project on behalf of my co-investigators today. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we all meet today. I'm speaking to you from Ironda country in Mabantua or Alice Springs. Um, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, um, and also extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, so I'm just gonna begin with a little bit of background about how this project has evolved. Um, so at the center of the project, we have women living in remote communities who are looking for ways to improve their health. Yet the opportunities to do so in remote communities can be limited um, due to lack of access to services and programs. Um, and the need to have um, opportunities for women to participate in health promoting activities is really highlighted by the high rates of chronic conditions that we do see in remote areas. Um, and we also know that these rates of chronic conditions are contributing to the life expectancy gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Um, and that's a key target area for the closing the gap strategy, um, which has been implemented for over a decade now, um, yet we're still not seeing meaningful improvements in Aboriginal wellbeing. Um, therefore, this highlights that there is still a lot of work to do in this area. From the perspective of a health service, High rates of chronic conditions are contributing to a shortfall in, capacity, in demand and capacity to deliver individualised health care. Um, and it's also worth noting that we are seeing a shift from the traditional client um, and clinician relationship to a paradigm where um, patients are now guiding their care in partnership with healthcare professionals which highlights the need for us to empower women and support them with skills and knowledge that they need to increase their control over their health. Um, and so group-based programs do offer a viable solution to meet the demands of healthcare um, service delivery and um, also an opportunity to provide empowerment and support for women. Um, there are a number of established chronic condition um, management programs that have been designed for Aboriginal Australians, um, yet these are often not well reported on or evaluated, um, and they are, are primarily designed for urban settings, um, so they can overlook the unique challenges of living in a remote area. Um, and lastly, and probably most importantly, um, there is a need for Aboriginal voice in the design of healthcare service delivery. Um, and the need for community-informed strategies to be implemented. Um, and this really just highlights that importance of community consultation in the planning phase, um, which is what I'll mostly focus on today. Um, so considering all this, um, our project aim was to improve appropriateness and efficacy of chronic disease management programs. Um, so we've set out to do this in two stages, um, and I'll just talk through the first stage, which was semi-structured interviews with women living with chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart or kidney sickness. Um, so to recruit for this study, we put up posters in key areas in the community, so such as the, the clinic, the shop and the activity centre. Um, but I suppose I've worked in this area for almost two years, so I do have the benefit of having um, a lot of time spent in community to develop pre-existing relationships, um, and that probably played quite a big factor in being able to um, recruit for this study. Um, so we sat down with about 10 different women across three different sites to learn their stories and experiences with health. 
Um, and you can see on the screen that the interview guide is up there. So we focused um, on seven key questions and had some prompts to guide um, the uh, conversation as well, if needed. Um, so we use thematic analysis um, to identify reoccurring themes within the interview transcripts um, using an inductive and deductive approach. Um, so we came up with about six different themes, but um, I'll just be summarising the barriers and enablers um, that we found today. Um, so to begin with, for the barriers for chronic disease self-management, um, women identified lack of access to healthy food as a barrier. Um, so we know that in remote stores, access um, to discretionary food items is a lot easier and usually a lot more convenient for people as well. Women also spoke about um, the lack of a supportive built environment. Um, so a lot of our communities don't have things like footpaths. So if you're a woman pushing a pram or with a mobility aid, um, it can make it hard to engage in physical activity such as walking. Um, and specific to this area, there is um, a lack of childcare services. So women also identified that as a barrier. Um, women also spoke a lot about the opportunities that were available to men. Um, so this was mostly around sport um, and specifically footy um, and talked about how these kinds of opportunities aren't as well supported or as available for women in community. Um, and they also discussed some psychosocial factors around stress and shame, but I'll come back to that a little bit in a little bit. Um, so for the enablers, um, for chronic disease self-management, women commonly spoke about the importance of connection to the country um, and being able to participate in traditional lifestyle activities, such as looking for bush tucker um, and I suppose spending that time on country as well. Um, women spoke about the importance of having role models in the community to help motivate themselves um, and keep people, um, I suppose, engaging in health promoting behaviours. Um, and given the transient workforce that we see in Central Australia, having a stable clinic staff um, that knew the community was also viewed as helpful for chronic disease self-management. And it links into that other um, enabler of having um, strong and trustful clinician-client relationships that are really important when we are working in this area. Um, so family was identified as both an enabler and a barrier. Um, women spoke about the importance of family in their lives and identified them as a key source of support. Um, and they commonly talked about their roles and responsibilities as main caretakers um, for other family members. Um, and a lot of the time when women were discussing this, they spoke about the stress and the worry that they felt for their family members and the sicknesses they might get or the sicknesses they may already have. Um, so that kind of linked back into that barrier of those psychosocial factors that some women do experience um, in community. Um, I've just got a couple of key quotes here. So this one here is just talking about um, the shame that women can feel if they're exercising, and particularly when it's in front of other people. Um, the one in the middle here is talking about that importance of connection to country. <coughs> And the last one in blue is just talking about, uh, I suppose, that impact of colonization and um, urbanization in those areas, specifically around um, the shops and um, the impact that junk food and discretionary food has had on health for people. Um, so we still have a bit of work to do in our program um, and most importantly we are looking to go back and speak to the women who in, uh, participated in those interviews and feedback what we found and then take a co-design approach um, with women to um, identify key elements for a women's health program and also how we can best support them. Um, I suppose from what we've already learned um, in, through the interviews um, we know that supporting participation of family in a pro women's health program is going to be important, um, as well as incorporating activities on country. Um, and I think um, we are looking to capacity build with community members um, and take on ongoing community consultations so that we can develop a bit of community ownership um, and sustainability um, with the programs, because a lot of the time, um, I suppose a lot of our work is quite ad hoc in Central Australia and also relies quite heavily on the visiting outreach staff. So 
um, yeah, just trying to develop something that community members can run um, on their own as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening, everyone. Time as well. Um, brilliant. So, do we have any questions uh, come up? We have not. Yep. Not just yet. One of your slides, I think it was on barriers, talked about um, uh, the, the lack of culturally safe communication relating to clinicians. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I think um, when that one was brought up by a few people and it was really just around um, who they felt safe with in the community where, and, and who they felt safe with going, sorry, I'll start again. <laughs> um, that one was around um, women going to the clinic and who they felt comfortable and safe with talking about their health conditions. Um, so um, for people who don't know much about Central Australia, we do have a very transient workforce and a lot of our remote area nurses are agency staff. So um, they might come and do very, short stints in our health clinic so they might come for two to four weeks so I suppose um, that's really around not having that time to build relationships and rapport um, and not people not necessarily um, being that well um, orientated to the communities as well yeah so hopefully that answers your question well, yeah it does but it also poses that whole issue about how do we how do we train you know and, and I know a lot of locums have to go into communities, and so how do we get them to be culturally competent um, before they even get into communities? Because there is often very segregated uh, male, female, um, you know, uh, 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 people in there, practitioners they're working with, and so uh, yeah, I guess it's a real issue, um, and particularly you know within the community, if people don't feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's probably an ongoing challenge. Um, but yeah, I definitely would agree that we need to be, um, yeah, I suppose very, well, cultural competency is really an ongoing learning experience. So we always need to be engaging um, mm. and learning as much as we can. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions. The first question is, um, uh, I wonder if there was any discussion about oral health in this community? Um, no, not around oral health. I think being a dietitian, um, I think people knew me as a dietitian, so it did come up around a lot around food and physical activity, um, but no, nothing specifically around oral health. But we definitely do have um, a lot of work in that area in Central Australia. Um, and health promotion campaigns. Um, the next question is, was there interest in physical activity as part of on-country traditional activities or was it more about sports opportunities and non-traditional exercise like gym? Um, I think walking groups are the most common thing that has come up and that we've spoken about. Um, and I suppose that can take place away from the community in other areas. Um, and things like pools um, and having gyms was also mentioned. Um, but yeah, most commonly women spoke about um, setting up a walking group. Yeah. Um, a final question is um, that from Isabella Kate says that she knows that in some communities in the top end, they've set up women's basketball or football competitions, et cetera. Are there anything similar in central communities for women only physical activities? Um, yeah, I think um, the main one I know of is softball. Um, so they do run a softball competition, um, but I suppose that there definitely are less opportunities for women. Um, and I, maybe for the, the kids uh, or women still attending school, there's a bit more opportunity to engage in things like basketball and um, footy, but once women, I suppose, are more middle-aged and older, um, there's, yeah, definitely a lack of sporting opportunities. Okay, that's it. Well, thank you very much, Gina, and all the best uh, out there. And hopefully